Welcome all of our guests. It is therefore now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Each and every day I hear another story from another family or senior that can't afford their hydro bill. Some parents have had to cancel their children's extracurricular activities. Long-term care homes are being put to the brink. Hospitals, I've heard from hospitals that have to cut necessary medical staff to pay their hydro bills. Seniors will have to leave their heat off because they can't afford the bill. And why is this all happening? Because the Auditor General revealed this government overpaid for renewable energy $9.2 billion. Oh, wow. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Energy is this. Tell me if the $1.3 million in donations to the Ontario Liberal Party was worth overpaying for hydro contracts by $9.2 billion. Here. Please. 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 Um, I'm already giving uh, you are already giving me signals that I may have to uh, uh, tighten things up a little, and I will. If it's necessary, I'm asking you to stop now. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise and answer the question from the uh, Leader of the Opposition. Um, he talked about hospitals, Mr. Speaker. I was very proud to be at my hospital in Greater Sudbury, Health Sciences North which actually worked with Greater Sudbury Utilities, which is actually saving $300,000 a year, Mr. Speaker, in electricity savings because they use one of the programs that we brought forward, Mr. Speaker. We've got so many programs out there to help small businesses, to help hospitals, to help long-term care centers, Mr. Speaker, that they can take advantage of this, and many long-term health centers, Mr. Speaker, can save up to 34 percent if they get on the ICI program, Mr. Speaker. So we've got programs out there that are helping organizations right across the province. And in terms of fundraising, Mr. Speaker, I want to know why you'd have to pay $2,000 to golf with the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Oh! Speaker. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell, come to order. And if it sounds like it's going to sound now, I'll, go, I'll move to warnings. Thank you. Supp supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Minister of Energy. And since the Minister doesn't does not want to talk about the donations to the Ontario Liberal Party and the contracts that should not have been signed, we can try something else, Mr. Speaker. I want to read to you a quote from the Minister of Community Safety and Social Services. And I quote: He said, "The Ontario Energy Board." certainly should not be justifying a rate increase based on the fact that they believe there was too much conservation, because that sends the wrong message. Well, Mr. Speaker, it certainly does send the wrong message. It's absurd. But Hydro Ottawa is doing exactly that, trying to raise rates for those who conserve. And so far, the Minister of Energy refuses to stand up for those people. Mr. Speaker, does the Minister of Energy agree with the Minister of Community and Social Services, and will his government Will the Liberal government finally condemn what Question. Hydro Ottawa is doing and, saying, and say very clearly it is unacceptable to charge more for conserving? Yes or no? Will you do it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I was very pleased to be with my honourable colleague in the Sioux talking about all the great programs that we're bringing out, Mr. Speaker, to help the families in Sault Ste. Marie and area and to help families in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. In relation to the OEB, the OEB has done a very good job as being a quasi judicial organization, Mr. Speaker, and an arm's reach from the government. And they've made sure, Mr. Speaker, that they've actually seen rates go down when asks have come in place. Let me show you their strong record of reviewing rate applications for the, with the consumer in mind, Mr. Speaker. Um, when Hydro One asked for a rate increase uh, for distribution, it received a 9% reduction for its capital request, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One once again asked for a rate increase for transmission, received a 3% reduction for its capital request. When OPG applied for a 6.2 rate increase in 2011, OEB denied that request and lowered rates by 0.8%, Mr. Speaker. The OEB has That's a good it. track record of consumers in mind, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy. The Minister of Energy does not want to talk about the donations to the Ontario Liberal Party for these renewable contracts. The Minister of Energy does not want to talk about the fact that they're now, char they're now charging people more for conservation. 
I don't think the minister understands how this is affecting families. Let me tell you a, a letter I got from my own riding in Simcoe North, from Dawn and Carolyn Copping from Penetanguishing. They are two seniors, 73 and 80. Dawn and Carolyn own their own home, but they still have a mortgage. They have energy-efficient bulbs, and they use the air conditioner as little as possible. They even kept all their appliances off for 16 days this summer, but they still can't afford their hydro bill. Mr. Speaker, it's a significant amount of money. Seniors are being forced to the brink. And so my question, Mr. Speaker, is rather than window dressing, will this government finally help Ontario seniors when it comes to the out-of-control hydro bill? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I do hope that the honourable member is telling that. Uh... I'm uh, stop the clock, please. I'm going to remind the chief government whip that holding things up as props are not allowed in the House, and I will uh, have them confiscated if it happens again. And I will offer him. And I will offer him a warning. Please finish. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I do hope that the honourable member is telling that family about the OESP program, in which seniors, Mr. Speaker, seniors can qualify for up to $75 a month off of their bill, Mr. Speaker. And come January 1st, these families as well, Mr. Speaker, will be getting that 8% reduction once the legislation passes through this House. And also, I'm hoping he's telling those families about that Save on Energy program to work with their utilities to make sure that they can find other ways, Mr. Speaker, of reducing their electricity bills. Because we do, Mr. Speaker have many programs in place to help these families. But when it comes to fundraising, Mr. Speaker, I know it costs $2,000 to play as a person with the Leader of the Opposition, but also to have a steak, Mr. Speaker, at Barbarian Steakhouse, $5,000 to play, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Start the clock. New question. The member from Dufferin Keller. Thank you. Here, here, here. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the acting premier. I have an email from a mother of a young boy named Conrad. Conrad has autism and attends Yes I Can Nursery School. Let me share what his mother had to say. Yes I Can has been life changing. We don't say this lightly. It has changed the lives of us, Conrad's parents, and it's changed the lives of his sisters. And most importantly, it has had an enormous impact on the life of Conrad. Mr. Speaker, can the Liberals please explain to Conrad and his family why Yes I Can will be forced to close their doors? To the Associate Deputy Minister Premier. of Education. Associate, Sir, Associate Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for the question. Absolutely, our government wants to give our kids the best start in life. Here, here. That's why we are making sure that we're moving more than a billion dollars towards childcare in this province wow. on a yearly basis. A in addition to that, we are now transforming the way we deliver childcare, and what we are doing is uh, moving our capacity to 100,000 new licensed spaces over the next five years. Thank you. When it comes to Yes I Can daycare and uh, ensuring that our children there get the best start in life, I want the member opposite to know that we are actually providing the City of Toronto $351.7 million in order to ensure that the childcare spaces and centres in the city are taken care of. 300,000 of that is being moved forward to Yes I Can childcare. In addition to that, there was one yes, time transitional funding that we moved forward to the centre. That funding was one-time transitional funding. Thank you. And thank you very much. Supplementary. Your transformation is leading to a closing of the doors of Yes I Can, which has been doing exceptional work in the City of Toronto. Back to the acting premier. The Liberals keep telling us Yes I Can can talk to the city, but it won't do any good. There is no mechanism for the City of Toronto to provide Minister of Housing. funds. In fact, a director of the city's Children's Services branch wrote exactly that to the school. Quote, there is no operating funds available to your agency outside of the current mechanism. I repeat, no operating funds. 
Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals stop passing the buck and give Yes I Can the sustainable funding she promised nine years ago? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, first of all, $351.7 million going to the City of Toronto to ensure that the childcare spaces and centres in the city are getting the support they need, I think, is a lot of money. In addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, 300,000 is being moved forward. And in addition to that, in addition to that, this particular centre got one-time transitional funding of uh, $150,000. Actually, it was moved forward more than once. It was one-time transitional funding, in the end totaling $450,000. $450,000 that was only supposed to be one-time transitional funding to enable them and ensure that they were coming up with a plan that they needed in order to be able to uh, take care of a financial, sustainable financial plan. But let me just tell you about our, transition, our, our transforming of childcare. That is going to be starting off to, from 2017 and over the next five years. Thank you. We are working on that plan. And Final supplementary. The Minister of Children and Youth Services just chirped, These are a this is a private operator. Is that really the issue? Is the problem that they are a private child care operator instead of a public one? That's wrong. Back to the Acting Premier. I want to share more of what Conrad's mom had to say. She asked that we, quote, imagine the immense feeling of relief we as parents feel knowing our son with special needs is being taken care of as if he is a member of the school's family. She asked you to try and visualize the look of joy in Conrad's sister's eyes as they heard him say his first word, sing his first song, and best of all, play with them. Conrad's mom added, this school has changed all of our lives and we cannot Question. imagine life without it. Mr. Speaker, will the acting premier tell Conrad and Conrad's mom Dad and sisters, why Conrad won't Thank be you. able to attend the school any longer. Thank you. You see the please. You see the please. And I would also appreciate the conversations that are going on between uh, caucuses while the question is being put, not to take place. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I really look forward to the opportunity to talk about what we're doing in childcare because I really think that this is a historic initiative and it really shows the vision. Stop the clock, please. I will ask the same. Uh, I will make the same comment as I just made for another group of people. The conversations will stop here. I don't need the mem mem member from Trinity Spadina to armchair quarterback. I, I'm not impressed. Answer, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and that's why we have committed to transforming the way we deliver childcare in this province. We understand that that's a conversation that can't go one way. It has to happen with a number of the uh, stakeholders out there and parents and people who are actually informed about what our childcare system needs in this province. So we are getting ready to have consultations across the province and have those conversations to find out where we should be looking and concentrating our efforts. I want you to know that when we came into uh, government in 2003, the party opposite had actually supplied parents in this province with 10 per cent of uh, the spaces that children needed when it came to child care. We immediately Answer. moved forward to double that capacity, and now we're moving forward to double that to 40 per cent. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Start the clock. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My questions to the acting premier, or rather the deputy premier speaker. The mayor of Toronto says he's discussing the sell-off of Toronto Hydro with the premier. My question is, does the government think it's a good idea to sell off Toronto Hydro? Thank you. Uh, to the minister of energy. 
Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the uh, leader of the third party for that question. Uh, ultimately, Mr. Speaker, decisions on how to manage, manage Toronto Hydro are at the discretion of the mayor and council of the city of Toronto, and the province will not interfere, Mr. Speaker, with what is an important decision under municipal jurisdiction, Mr. Speaker. In fact, um, you know what, Mr. Speaker. We at, uh, on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, are, are looking at broadening our decision with Hydro One. The decision is facilitating key investments, Mr. Speaker, in infrastructure priorities right across the province that is improving lives and the quality of lives of people of Ontario. And there's a few examples, Mr. Speaker, and I know I'll be able to get more in the supplemental, but $13.5 billion is being invested in the, G, uh, the GO Regional Express Rail in the GTHA, Mr. Speaker, with a quadruple the number of weekly Answer. trips to 6,000. Mr. Speaker, there are so many great infrastructure projects going right across the province, Mr. Speaker, that I'll get more to that in my Thank supplemental. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, this uh, government is not only leaving the door wide open to selling Toronto Hydro, and it indeed is in fact willing to facilitate that sell-off with brand new tax giveaways, but there are more than 70 local hydro utilities in this province, Speaker. And so that begs the question, which other local utilities, local hydro utilities, does this government hope will become private, for-profit corporations? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, back in 2012, um, the LDC panel pre presented a report that talked about the Ontario Distribution Sector Review Panel, and it recommended that uh, LDCs merge to create eight to 12 regional LDCs through mandatory consolidations, well, Mr. Speaker. And the panel suggested that this would result in a net benefit of roughly $1.2 billion, okay. Mr. Speaker, in present value terms. And so after the consolidation report, Mr. Speaker, this this is actually money that we can go and put back into the system to continue to put downward rates or downward pressure on rates for ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. Consolidating is actually something that the panel is recommending. And if you look at California, for example, Mr. Speaker, with a population of 30 million Answer. people, they have four LDCs, Mr. Four. Speaker. We have 72. We have voluntary consolidation out there, Mr. Speaker, and it's something that would benefit Thank the ratepayers. Here, here. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the bottom line is that selling off Hydro One and selling local hydro companies might be good for Mr. Uh, or rather the uh, uh, the uh, minister's friends and people at the top that the Liberals tend to actually spend a lot of time helping out, but it's not good for everybody else. It's lousy for everybody else because it's families and businesses that pay the freight Minister for the, Tourism, for the benefits Culture and Sport, that actually come accrue over. to the very few people at the top with these privatization schemes. And guess what? Families and businesses in this province simply cannot afford it, Speaker. And while the Premier might like to pretend that she is uh, saying no to uh, the, co the cost of hydro, it's simply not true. Rather, that she has no say over the cost of hydro, it's simply not true. We know that these privatization schemes increase the price of our electricity across the province of Ontario. Selling off the hydro system absolutely means bills Question. will go up. The cost of electricity is four times higher than it was when this government took over. Why is the government making things worse when they could be, be saving the people of this province by stopping any further sell-offs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I do have to say it's disappointing to hear that you know the great work that was done by this panel with some great people that put a lot of time and effort into this to recommend this, Mr. Speaker. One person that's very well respected by all parties is Floyd Logren, who was on this committee who brought forward this report, Mr. Speaker. So you know what, Mr. Speaker, we're finding ways and continuing to find ways to save billions of dollars for ratepayers. The voluntary consolidation, Speaker, uh, is one way that this could happen. In terms of, of the broadening the sale of Hydro One, I was talking earlier about all of the great infrastructure projects that are happening across the province. I know I talked about uh, you know the, Gro the Go Regional Express, the El Eglinton Crosstown LRT. One billion is being invested in uh, the infrastructure for Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Community in Infrastructure Fund being tripled to $300 million. Not only $20 million That's coming sir. into my community, $173 million on Highway 69, Mr. Speaker. I know I'm running out of time but we keep having more and more infrastructure Thank investments you. right across the province. New question. 
The, the next of the question is uh, for the Deputy yeah. Premier Speaker. Yesterday, the Liberals and the Conservatives once again voted in favour of privatizing Hydro One and helping to privatize local utilities, local yeah. hydro utilities. Yeah. So, can the government tell the people uh, on what page of their platform did it say that they were going to dole out tax giveaways worth over $100 million to help privatize even more hydro utilities in this province, including Toronto Hydro? Thank you, the Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I'm, I'm very pleased to stand and rise to answer this question because I know the platform talked about jobs and growth, Mr. Speaker, and the investments that we're making with, uh, you know, the broadening the sale of, of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. I know I didn't have enough time the last time, so let me continue, Mr. Speaker. The Here Ontario LRT in Mississauga and Brampton will provide 20 kilometres of new, modern, reliable rapid transit beginning in 2022, Mr. Speaker. Thanks in part to a $1.4 billion investment, Mr. Speaker, by this government. Another $1 billion will support phase two of Ottawa's LRT expansion, Mr. Speaker. And I know, Mr. Speaker, I talked about $173 million coming to help expand uh, Highway 69 to four lanes. Mr. Speaker, that's doing great things for us in the north. Not only is it making our highways safer, it's actually bringing more jobs and growth to our communities because we have opportunities for businesses to see us as part of the 400 series of highways, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank really thank the Minister from uh, Transportation for seeing the importance of that and Answer. investing in that, Mr. Speaker, because we're doing great things right across the province, building jobs and building this province up, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, everywhere I go in Ontario, people tell me that they can't afford their hydro bills. This government is not understanding where the people of this province are at. They tell me that they are bitterly, bitterly disappointed in the Premier and her party because the hydro sell-off is making life harder for folks instead of making life better. And that is not what was promised to them during the last election, Speaker. When people tell me they can't afford privatized Hydro One or the sell-off of local hydro, their local hydro company, it, it begs the question for me, what does, the government, think? does growth, the government think these people are wrong? Does the government think Ontarians are wrong when they're saying we shouldn't be selling off our hydro system? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The only thing that's wrong, Mr. Speaker, is the understanding that the NDP has when it comes to the broadening of Hydro One. The OEB sets the rates, Mr. Speaker. The sell-off and the, the broadening of the sale has nothing to do with it, Mr. Speaker. But we do, we do recognize, Mr. Speaker, that some families are having a difficult time with their electricity bills. And so, Mr. Speaker, we have those six programs in place: the OESP program, Mr. Speaker, the LEAP program, you know, the we, uh, we, we uh, also have the Northern Ontario tax credit, Mr. Speaker. We eliminated the debt retirement charge, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, on top of that, Mr. Speaker, we actually brought forward our, our speech from the throne, which actually is having an 8% reduction for all families right across the province. And for 330,000 families living in rural, remote, or northern communities, they will also see a 20% reduction, Mr. Speaker. So we actually recognize that some families are having difficulty, and we've put in place programs to help, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, what the Liberals don't understand is what 80% of the people of this province want and that is to maintain a public electricity system in the province of Ontario for our generation and generations to come. That's what they don't understand. They want to know that there's going to be a good future for them, Speaker, a good future for them and their families right here in the province of Ontario. They know that the Conservatives aren't the answer. They know that that will lead to more cuts and more privatization, but they feel that the Liberals have let them down, Speaker, in a very, very big way. Instead of stopping the sell-off of Hydro One, the government is taking that bad idea and one-upping it by clearing the way for the sell-off of local distribution companies, of local hydro Hydro companies. Speaker, people want hope for the future. Will this government stop the privatization of our electricity system Question. and do what 80% of the people in this province actually want? Thank you.
Mr. Speaker, what the people of Ontario want is actually jobs and growth, Mr. Speaker, and this government is delivering. We're building this province up, Mr. Speaker. You know what? The, 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 again, they're not understanding the concept, Mr. Speaker, that we have a quasi-judicial organization called our, the OEB, which is our regulator, Mr. Speaker, and the regulator is the one that sets the rates, Mr. Speaker. But what we've done, Mr. Speaker, by building infrastructure, we're making sure that we're creating jobs and growth right across the province. But we've also invested, Mr. Speaker, heavily in renewables. We have 18,000 megawatts of renewable energy in this province, Mr. Speaker. And you know what's really important is the um, the, the 4.3 yes exactly, but the 4.3 billion dollars, Mr. Speaker, that we're saving in health care costs. And you know what? This year, the Toronto Vital Signs Report came out, Mr. Speaker, and let me quote: In Toronto, premature deaths and hospitalizations as a result of Answer. air pollution have dropped by 23 and 41 percent since 2004. That's a record, Mr. Speaker, that everyone should be proud of. You see it, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is to the President of the Treasury Board. This week, the government released unaudited financial statements without verification from the Auditor General. This is unprecedented in Ontario's history. It's clear this government has something to hide. Right. They refuse to cooperate with many independent legislative officers. They continue to break their legal obligations, and now they are viciously attacking the credibility of the Auditor General. But the people of Ontario know better, Speaker. They trust the numbers of the independent, nonpartisan auditor, not the numbers of a government mired in waste, scandal, and mismanagement. I ask the minister, will you stop attacking the credibility of the Auditor General? What's the final funder? So, may I go ahead? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what I wanted to point out was I think you missed a comment yesterday that the Auditor General made, which was to confirm that, in fact, our 2015 16 bottom line is accurate. And, of course, Speaker, that's because, uh, because Cabinet made a regulation, uh, the purpose of the regulation being to resolve, for this year at least, the dispute between the Auditor. General and the public servants who are our accountants, and we needed to resolve that. Cabinet made a regulation saying use the auditor's numbers, which is exactly what we did in the financial statements that Answer. we released. So, in fact, as I pointed out yesterday, our numbers agree with her numbers, Thank you. and our current year is. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Well, the Auditor General has now confirmed a number of troubling revelations. The deficit of, uh, is $1.5 billion higher than the government's projections. Wow. Debt increased more than $20 billion during last year. Taxes imposed by this government have increased to a record of $91.8 billion this year. That's up more than 20 per cent in the last five years. Under this government, Ontario is now both the most indebted and the most taxed province in Canada. That just doesn't even make sense. It does not add up. Rather than address their financial waste and mismanagement, this government continues to attack the credibility of the auditor. I ask the minister, will you come clean Question. and apologize to the Auditor General for attacking her credibility? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. President. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think one of the pieces of information that uh, is missing in that li uh, little catalog is the fact that, in fact, Ontario has the lowest per capita program spending of any province or territory in Canada, of any jurisdiction. So when you actually look at our per capita program spending, we have controlled that very, very successfully, which is why, Speaker, when you look at our deficit 
projection in the 2015 budget, you would see it was $8.5 billion. When you look at the actual deficit we re achieved in last year, according to the Auditor General, our deficit is $5 billion. That is $3.5 billion dollar improvement on our position at the budget, and it shows that we will be able to balance Here. as we promised. I'm uh, sure the members would uh, forgive me my interruption, um, uh, not given the time that we don't know what's going to happen shortly. I would like to introduce uh, in the House, in the members' uh, gallery, uh, from Beaches East York 37th and the Beaches Woodbine 35th and 36th, and now a member of our Canadian Senate, Francis Lankin. I won't start the clock until the question is put. A new question, the member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. People deserve to have confidence in our health care system, but all too often, Ontarians are let down by this Liberal government. This morning, we've learned the Health Ministry was spending $2.5 million a year for an outsourced PSW registry that never did what the Liberals promised. Okay. And for four years, the Liberals failed to provide oversight to make sure the registry was working for the people of Ontario. Sure. Why did this government spend so much time and so much money on a PSW that did not help home care patients and did not help families and did not live up to the Liberals' promises? Thank you. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Long Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it is true that following a review of the registry, we made a decision. I made a decision to suspend that registry. We felt that we could, on a go-forward basis, we would work with our stakeholders and partners to actually improve what the registry is fundamentally set out to do, and that's to protect the safety and security of Ontarians and to provide an important resource for both caregivers and those who might want to employ a PSW and also organizations that uh, are in the business of employing them. So we're working on that, but I have to say I'm so proud of the efforts of this government, the success of this government in elevating our PSWs across this province, beginning with a $4 an hour wage increase that that party voted against, Mr. Speaker, and also working to establish a common curriculum as well. And it's really about not only providing that confidence to Ontarians, but elevating this important profession, giving them the respect that they are due because of the hard work that they engage in each and every day, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Speaker, back to the Acting Premier. PSWs do extraordinary work every day, and families deserve to have total confidence that their government is looking out for them. But the failure of the PSW registry shows that the Liberals are more interested in making big, flashy announcements than actually helping people. In 2011, five years ago, it was the acting premier who promised that the PSW registry, quote, would promote greater accountability and transparency, but it never did that. In fact, the government's secret report found that home care clients and family caregivers could not rely on the registry to actually help them. Why did this Liberal government fail? to keep their promise to frontline workers, families, and hundreds of thousands of people Question. who rely on home care across the province of Ontario. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are keeping our promise. They had no promise to our PSWs, Mr. Speaker, and it's only when we introduced important measures, a $4 an hour wage increase for our PSWs, a $10 million training fund, which is rolled out as providing support to allow our PSWs to further enhance their training, a common curriculum, Mr. Speaker. We're working across the board with our PSWs, which they have never done, Mr. Speaker, and we've made those commitments and we're following through. And on Ontarians are better off as a result, and our health care system is better off as a result of the hard work that our PSWs do every day, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. 
Your question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of International Trade. In June of this year, the Premier unveiled a new cabinet and a number of new ministries. Notably, the portfolio of international trade became a standalone ministry for the first time in the history of Ontario. Now, in my riding of Kitchener Centre, we have a number of businesses that currently export or are looking at growing internationally. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that uh, I have ongoing conversations with many stakeholders who are looking forward to this. They couldn't be more excited with the creation of this new ministry. Speaker, could the ministry, minister please tell us how his new ministry is going to better serve businesses in Ontario? Thank you, Minister of International Trade. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, for the opportunity. And I want to thank the honourable member from Kitchener Centre for asking, and also for her uh, really business outreach in her area. Speaker, I was so pleased when I heard that the Premier will be creating a standalone international trade ministry. Since then, Speaker, I have travelled extensively to numerous municipalities in the province, met with countless businesses and foreign dignitaries, and everyone I have spoken will share that excitement. Speaker, international markets play a critical role in the growth of Ontario's economy. This new ministry will allow me to focus on bringing jobs and investment back to Ontario as part of our commitment to grow our economy. Whether it be convincing overseas companies to invest in Ontario or, or assisting Ontario companies in going global, Answer. our ministry will help connect Ontario to the world. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer, and I've invited him to come to Kitchener Centre to speak to my stakeholders about this new Ministry of International Trade. Well, the Premier and the Minister have said that they have very big plans for the new Ministry of International Trade as part of our promise to grow our economy. Specifically, this government's commitment to trade missions was noted in both the 2016 budget and in the throne speech that was brought forward just a few weeks ago. I know that the minister has participated in a number of trade missions over the past couple of years. Speaker, could the minister please explain why these trade missions are so important to growing our economy here in the province of Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank again for the honourable member for asking the question again. Speaker, in business, relationships are key. Trade missions allow our government to meet with business counterparts in person. We can prove to them why Ontario is where they need to invest in a way we never can do it over email or telephone. In just two years, trade missions have succeeded. 3.7 billion in investment to the promise. Speaker, we have connected Ontario businesses with opportunities abroad, brought jobs to municipalities like Cambridge, Waterloo, Kitchener, and promote Ontario worldwide. Speaker, we will continue to participate in missions to key markets abroad and will continue to build Answer. on this success. We are living in a highly globalized world, we must make our marks worldwide. Thank you. Speaker. Thank you. Finished? Thank you. Member from Sarnia Lake. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Speaker, to you and through you to the Acting Premier, last Friday I received a call from Lonnie Cope, a constituent of mine in Petroya, a first responder with more than two decades of experience responding whenever and wherever he was needed. Lonnie told me that the Workplace uh, Traumatic Stress Program at London Health Science Centre, which he has been utilizing to deal with symptoms of PTSD, is being cancelled effective December 2nd. London Health Science Centre says there is no support from your government to keep this program running. Lonnie is being told that the next pla closest place that he can access these same services now offered by the Workplace Traumatic Stress Program is in Toronto, hundreds of kilometres away from our community. The Acting Premier, Speaker, the Workplace Traumatic Stress Program at London Health Science Centre closes for good in eight weeks. Will your government commit today to stepping up and support this program before December 2nd deadline? Thank you. Uh, speaking to the Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank 
you, Speaker, and thank you to the question. Certainly, I think the interest that the uh, province has now in post-traumatic stress disorder, the impact that it's had on first responders in this province is one that, that has really accelerated over the years. WSIB now has a program in place. Those people that are first responders in our province, Speaker, now have presumptive legislation. The ease of, of obtaining that treatment, Speaker, has been accelerated over the years. One of the centres we have used, Speaker, at the WSIB is uh, the London Health Sciences Centre. As we take a look at services that are made available to uh, to uh, our first responders. We'd like to see them obviously provided on a province-wide basis, Speaker. I will, take the question from the, uh, I will take the question from the minister, talk to the WSIB again, Speaker, and see if these changes are indeed in the best interest of the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, and back to the acting premier. Premier, earlier this week, the CTV News London, your uh, station in your town, reported that the Workplace Traumatic Stress Program at London Health Sen Science Centre was closing because of a $500,000 annual shortfall in program funding from your government. First responders and clients of the Workplace Traumatic Stress Program have called this news devastating. Mr. Speaker, it takes a special type of person to risk their own health and safety, to rush to the aid of others in an emergency. Every community in Ontario depends on these brave individuals in a time of crisis. Mr. Speaker, to the Acting Premier, will you commit today to fully funding the Workplace Stress Program at London Health Science Centre so the first responders in our province have access to treatments and services where they need them? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the uh, member. I know that he's asking the uh, he's asking the question in a sincere manner because I think all members of this House understand that what we haven't done in the past, Speaker, when it comes to our first responders and treatment for PTSD, is something we should do in the future. Something we can get better at, Speaker. As we examine the services that are available to first responders around the province, obviously we try and make those services as localized as possible. The WSIB, Speaker, which is an independent agency strives as hard as it can to make sure that people don't have to travel long distances to obtain those services. I appreciate the question from the, uh, from the member opposite. I think it's a sincere question, and I, as I said, I will interact with the WSIB, the board of directors, and the people there that are running that organization yes, to make sure we're providing services in the way we should, Speaker. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener-Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Acting Premier. Never before has a provincial government released unaudited financial statements. What's more astonishing is that several sections from these statements were missing, such as the financial statements from the WSIB, the Ontario Clean Water Agency, the OEFC, and the former Hydro One Brampton. Yesterday, I asked the Premier to explain why these sections were missing. She could not. During the Public Accounts Committee yesterday, I was repeatedly told by government members that the WSIB statements had been posted, but I checked again this morning. They are still not there. What is the government hiding by withholding the WSIB statements? Thank you. Thank you. President of the Treasury Board. President, direct, President of Thank the Thank you Treasury very Board. much. And uh, I do want to assure the, the member opposite that the WSIB economic statement for 2016 is available online, as is the 2016 sufficiency plan update. Uh, all of the material related to the WSIB will, in fact, uh, be included uh, when we are able to table the uh, public account. So I do want to assure the House of that. Uh, what, what I also I also want to assure the House is that uh, while we are obviously in the process of collecting documents and preparing to have them uh, in the process of having them printed, that all of the finances of these various agencies have been accounted for Answer. in the financial statements that were made available earlier uh, this week. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, it is my understanding, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the chair of the WSIB signed off on the financial statements weeks ago, but they are still not posted. The statements are complete. The government refuses to publish them. It refuses to explain why. There have been growing calls for an ombudsman investigation of the WSIB by injured workers who say that they were denied benefits that they are entitled to. I raised this yesterday at public accounts. There is great interest in the accountability of the WSIB to the public. 
and certainly from injured workers. Why is the Premier withholding the WSIB statements? Publish them now. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. The statements have been available online, Speaker, uh, for quite some time. In addition, the uh, numbers that are in those statements, I think, is something we should all be proud of Good in news. this House. The Good WSIB, like the I think, has, uh, has been an organization that all parties, when they've been in government, have tried to organize, have tried to run in a better manner. Wow. I think what we're seeing coming out of the WSIB with the figures and with the numbers that the member is talking about is a very good news story. We're seeing we passed historic legislation last year that's included in these numbers, good. reinstating for the first time full indexation of WSIB benefits, wow. Speaker, something, something that the opposition, the NDP, took away oh. from injured workers, Speaker. So when you look at this, you see full Get CPI applied in a way that it should be. By 2018, Speaker, all yes, injured workers both partially and fully disabled, are going to receive their full CPI. That's what's contained in the figures. Those figures Thank have been you. available online, Speaker. Ah. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, in the spring, you introduced the Patients First Act to further improve patient access and experience. This bill, formerly known as Bill 210, included a plan to transform the health care system into one that puts the needs of the patient at its center. I've often heard from my constituents in Davenport about their concerns and really about concerns from many Ontarians about access and the ability of our health care system to meet the growing needs of Ontarians for today and into the future. So I'm pleased that our government was introducing a bill that would help moder modernize our health care system to better respond to patient needs. Speaker, can the Minister of Health please update this House on the government's plan to put patients first? Thank you, Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member from Davenport for this important question. And I want to once again acknowledge the abundance of talent uh, that's represented by our health care sector partners in the gallery today that have joined us. Uh, it's an important day, Mr. Speaker. We've listened to Ontarians and we've heard their concerns. I want this province to know that this government is committed to making sure our health care system directly reflects patients' needs, Mr. Speaker. And later today, I will reintroduce the Patients First Act, which would, if passed, put patients at the absolute center of a truly integrated health care system. It would give Ontario's 14 LINs the ability to connect all parts of the health care system, including primary care and home and community care, to improve the planning and delivery of frontline services to patients. This will mean Answer. easier and more equitable access to care and better coordination and continuity of care, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. I know our government has worked hard to ensure that patients are at the centre of Ontario's health care system, and I understand that the proposed system changes would strengthen local health care planning and increase efficiency to allow for more funding to be directed to patient care. I'm also pleased to hear that our government is recognizing the importance of French language in the provision of health care services and honouring our commitment to meaningful engagement with our Indigenous partners. Speaker, can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please tell this House about what this proposed legislation could mean for Ontarians? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the uh, member. The Patients First Act, if passed, will be the next step in our government's efforts to build a better Ontario for patients, Mr. Speaker. Our plan includes priority initiatives that we know are important to Ontarians, including expanding access to home and community care and ensuring that every Ontarian has access to a primary care provider. Uh, these proposed legislative changes reflect our vision for creating a truly integrated system that facilitates local health care planning to ensure that patients receive more equitable access to care that meets their needs, establishes a formal relationship, importantly, Mr. Speaker, between our LINs and our local boards of health to support joint health services planning, and most importantly, ensures that patient voices are at the heart of a system that is accountable to patients and connects them with the care that yes, they sir. need. Thank you. Okay. New question. Member from Halliburton, Fourth Lake Clark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Over the last few months, I've traveled across the province meeting with police and frontline service providers who expressed frustration about the government's lack of action on human sex trafficking. 
Just last Friday, I was in Hamilton meeting with the local police and victim organizations who echoed the same frustration. They told the story of a girl at a local university who was pursued by a fellow student, convinced to go on a date with him, but he proved to have other motivations and manipulated her into a situation where she was trafficked. What this shows is this is happening can happen to anyone and it is happening across the province as we speak the government may say they've taken action but to date no one on the front lines is clear on the details so my question is to the attorney general is the government ready to admit question. that they can't keep up on the human sex trafficking and that they are failing the children and all the other victims of this evil evil crime <laughs> Minister responsible for women's issues. The minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the member for the important question. We know human trafficking is a complex issue, and our message to those who engage in this horrible crime is very, very clear. It will not be tolerated in Ontario and none of its forms. And that's why we la launched our strategy, Speaker, in June. Up to $72 million is committed to this initiative. And action is underway, Speaker. There's many actions underway across a number of different ministries. <coughs> We're doing quite well, thank you. Keep it that way, please. Thank you. We are setting up the Provincial Anti-Trafficking Coordination Office with the Community and Social Services. We're establishing a Provincial Human Trafficking Answer. Prosecution Team. We're expanding a Quick Victim Response Team and enhancing Victim Crisis Ass Assistance Ontario Program. Many other initiatives are underway. <laughs> Well, Mr. Speaker, it is just uh, a message because there is no action, uh, and I'm going to go back to the Attorney General. I'll remind the Attorney General that his own predecessor is on record as saying, quote, we Order. don't know enough about human trafficking. Frontline service providers and workers do know, and they are exasperated that there is still nothing advancing the law to support them in fighting this horrific crime. In fact, the legislative measures in my private member's girl, such as the protection order, could have directly helped the vic protect the victim in Hamilton that I just mentioned. Legal changes and awareness efforts are part of the solution. So my question to the government is simple. Will you bring the Saving the Girl Next Door Act up for debate at committee, and will you support it through to the end? Through the end. Minister. Well, Speaker, this member was part of the roundtable on sexual violence and harassment, and uh, she was very active in that, and I, I acknowledge her efforts for that. But she also knows that our strategy is comprehensive, it's multi-ministry, involves a lot of different investments, and uh, there's dedicated resources, Speaker, and a coordinated planning process. So our strategy is much, much broader than the creating a task force or the legislative changes in her Bill 158. A cornerstone of the strategy, as I mentioned, is the Anti-Human Trafficking Office. Uh, it requires a lot of work by different ministries different levels of government, police forces. This is complicated. It will take time to solve, but we've already taken steps. Answer. We're investing across the system. I hope she joins me in supporting the investments that we're making to end this Thank horrible you. crime. Your question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Water should be a public trust. Last week, I met uh, with people from Guelph, including two city councillors, who are very concerned about the government's rubber stamping of permits to take water. It's clear that we need an Ontario water strategy to ensure that there's enough clean water for people today and for generations to come. We need to see change now, Speaker. The President of the Treasury Board thinks that concerns about water are based on misinformation. Does the rest of the government feel the same way, Speaker? Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you, Mr. Speaker, very much, and thank you to the honourable member opposite for the question. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work on zero waste and climate change, and probably have about the heaviest environmental legislative Heavy agenda lifting. of just about any government in many, many years, Mr. Speaker. Um, and 
This is the intersection of all of those problems. It's, there's waste issues, there's environmental issues, and with the terrible droughts that we're having and climate change, we know these are going to become acute. We've been working very hard for about over the last year, Mr. Speaker, with environmental groups, with industry. We will soon be bringing forward a very aggressive program mm. to protect groundwater, to ensure issues of water pricing. Uh, I am very interested in hearing from the parties opposite, and the member opposite would be happy to sit down with her to ensure that the input of her party is reflected Answer. in the Thank actions you. of the government. Thank you. Well, what, what seems worrisome to myself and other speakers is that the government seems to think that the way to protect water for generations to come is to simply charge more. Well, that's not good enough, Speaker, because that simply means it goes to the highest bidder. And instead of ensuring that there's water, good water, good clean water for drinking, growing food, and sanitation, it's just going to be about who can pay a higher price. People deserve a real strategy that puts the public interest first, that ba that's based on the idea that all Ontarians should be able to access clean water, that has sustainable long-term planning, and that isn't based on commodifying one of our most precious resources. It's time for a full review, absolutely, of the permit to take water system and a comprehensive, evidence-based Ontario water strategy to ensure access to clean water for all Ontarians Question. in this generation and generations to come. Does this government agree? Thank you. Um, yes, we agree. And to go further than that, uh, I take that as very constructive criticism from the Leader of the Opposition, and I appreciate it. I share her concerns. She is quite correct, as far as I'm concerned, that simply charging for water is not the solution. It is more complex. As the member for Guelph uh, has, uh, has expressed, we have a complex farm and agricultural and food community here, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we know uh, our food security, our water security, and the great work that farmers do, uh, and the great work that's being done by AMAFRA and the University of Guelph is also important. Uh, and we don't see the agriculture food industries here as the problem. We see them as important parts. I think the member for Guelph has articulated that. She's also articulated to me, uh, Mr. Speaker, the importance of water conservation, because she is very aware in her area, uh, as, as in the Cambridge area, yes, they sir. are some of the most water-stressed areas uh, in the province. And we have to look at this through the lens of, of water stress and the role of municipalities in being able to manage regional water. Thank you. And I think the member opposite will be happy to see all those things reflected Thank in you. our actions. Thank you. Your question, the member from Dr. Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for women's issues. Mr. Speaker, the media has been reporting that Ontario has become a hub for human trafficking. Every day, more victims are being forced into the sex trade industry and trafficked across the province and the country. Human trafficking is a deplorable crime that has long-lasting sociological and psychological impacts on survivors. It over it overwhelmingly targets young women, girls, boys, and particularly those in Indigenous communities. I know our government takes this issue very seriously and recognizes the devastating impact human trafficking has on victims and their families. Minister, could you tell me what steps you are taking towards combating the heinous crime of human trafficking in our province? Thank you. Minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Brampton Springdale. Again, an important question on this very serious issue of human trafficking. We know some of the most vulnerable people in our society are at the greatest risk of being trafficked, and it's our duty to act decisively and effectively to protect them from exploitation. Human trafficking in all of its forms cannot be tolerated, and that's why we are making the investment of up to $72 million. And I want to say two things about that, Speaker. It's focused on supporting survivors, and it's focused on holding offenders accountable for their horrific actions, and, and we will not tolerate this. So we will have more support for survivors and more mechanisms in place to hold offenders accountable. And I'll speak more in the supplementary speaker about the different uh, aspects of that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the minister for her answer and for the hard work she's been doing to make our province safer from human traffickers. That the minister has been working with other members of cabinet on various initiatives that will make Ontario a safer province. These collaborations across ministries are important to ensuring that our most vulnerable victims, our most vulnerable members of society, are protected from traffickers, and that human traffickers are caught, and that we have strong supports in place for survivors. Can the minister please describe some of her work across government to address these important issues? Thank you, minister. 
Thank you. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the measures we're putting in place to combat this horrific crime. So, for example, Speaker, with the Ministry of the Attorney General, we're working on enhanced justice initiatives to support effective prosecution of human trafficking crimes. We've already begun, Speaker, to hire Crown prosecutors for provincial human trafficking prosecution team. And with our Ministry of Children and Youth Services, we are strengthening support for youth leaving children's aid societies, and we are enhancing protocols between children's aid societies and police services. These are just a few of our initiatives, Speaker, uh, that we are undertaking to address this crime and to create a strategy that, again, is focused on supporting survivors and holding offenders accountable. This is a very serious uh, issue, Speaker, and uh, we are very committed to Answer. tackling this Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Cap Chatham, Kent Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Mr. Speaker, the London police estimate that they handled over 2,000 mental health calls in 2014. These calls could be better dealt with by the medical community. Now, this problem has gotten progressively worse under the Liberal government. Police services have reported that the number of mental health calls have skyrocketed over the last decade. The average wait for funded counseling and treatment is measured in months, not days. And this forces people to call 911 instead. So, Speaker, to the Acting Premier, why does Ontario force those experiencing mental health issues to call the police instead of providing medical help? Thank you. Thank you, Premier. To the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I appreciate the uh, question uh, from the member opposite. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, commend our police services right across this province for the incredible job that they do day in and day out dealing with very, very uh, challenging circumstances. And the member is quite right. And there are a number of exemplary uh, enforcement detachments that we can talk about, uh, in particular the example in Hamilton and the work that is being done with the mental health uh, experts who are participating with police uh, in uh, calls where there's a belief for, that an individual uh, may have mental health issues. And so recently, uh, through our Proceeds to Crime, we've also supported projects across the province for various police uh, forces, municipal police forces, so that they can engage with mental Answer. health partners in their communities to bring them along on calls to address these types of issues. Thank, thank you, you, Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, Minister, I won't disagree with you on the fact that our police do do exemplary work. The Liberal government status quo is inefficient use of public dollars and an unfair burden to place on emergency responders. Speaker, the London Police Service estimates that mental health calls account for roughly 15 percent of its budget, costing them more than $14 million. But worst of all is the human cost. The status quo is a tragic disservice to Ontarians suffering from mental health issues. Police have called this government time and time again to step up and to address the issue. But to date, the Liberal government has a failing grade. All talk, no action. So, Speaker, to the minister, when will the government Pleasure. start to take mental health seriously instead of leaving frontline officers and emergency responders to deal with the fallout? Thank you. Yes, sir. You know, Speaker, the characterization is, uh, is completely unfair. You know, I was at the Ontario Police College a couple of weeks ago meeting with folks at the Ontario Police College about the training that they're getting to address individuals with mental health. I had an opportunity to speak to a class, in fact, a new class of recruits, and they were in the middle of de-escalation training related to mental health. We know there's an ombudsman report with 22 recommendations that our government uh, has committed to implementing. A speaker, I'll have more to say on that at the end of the month. But our police forces across the province are being equipped and are being supported with mental health resources so that they can deal with the exact types of calls and issues that they are increasingly facing 
in our communities today. This is very, very important, Speaker, to policing across Ontario. I will have more to say about our strategy for Safer Ontario that we want to uh, implement, which Answer. also has tremendous benefit uh, for individuals with mental uh, illness. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Um, the time for question period has ended. I do want to uh, uh, make one uh, to my colleagues. I do want to make one uh, sad announcement, and that uh, this is the last day for our pages. And we want to show our appreciation for the wonderful work that they've done for us. Uh, I would thank you for that kind reception. I will recognize the leader of the third party on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I seek unanimous consent for the immediate second and third reading passage of Bill 38, an act to proclaim October Islamic Heritage Month, tabled by my colleague, member for Le London Champ Fanshawe, along with the members for Scarborough Rouge River and Etobicoke North. The leader of the third party is seeking unanimous consent for second and third reading. Do we agree? We agree. Agreed. Second reading of Bill 38, an act to proclaim the month of October Islamic Heritage Month. Ms. Armstrong, Mr. Cho, and Mr. Quadri. The member from London, Fanshawe. Second reading of Bill 38, an act to proclaim the month of October Islamic Heritage Month by Ms. Armstrong, Mr. Cho, and Mr. Quadri. <laughs> Pardon? Time. Seconds. Yes. Ms. Armstrong moves second re reading of Bill 8. Do we agree? Yeah. Carry. Second reading of the bill. Order M38, third reading of Bill 38, an act to proclaim the month of October, Islamic Heritage Month. Ms. Armstrong. Correct uh, my record, Bill 38. <laughs> The member from London Fanshawe. Speaker, I move third reading of Bill 38, an act to proclaim yeah, the month getting, of October Islamic Heritage Month. Yeah. And this to the third. The, the member from uh, the member from Ms. Armstrong moves the third reading of Bill 38. Uh, is it the pleasure of the House? The motion carried. Yeah. Carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. Point of order, the member from Anglinton Lawrence. Speaker, uh, I would like to invite all members of the House to attend a reception uh, on uh, basically marking Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Day in Ontario in room 247. I'd like to invite all the medical professionals to hear to learn more about the important investment we're making in pregnancy and infant loss across this province, room 247. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.